right, we're live. We're live now. Uh, Professor Mark Boyd is going to be presenting uh, his talk right now, so take the floor. <laughs> so I think we've had some technical problems. Uh, I think that some of my slides, in fact, won't work. Um, so I'll try to um, manage as best I can. I've got some problems with videos and uh, animations. So this, the title um, of the talk, um, where does it show for you guys? Okay. So it's just warming up, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. So um, I might wait until that appears. So the I can read the title. So, so the title I, I thought of was Wear Sunscreen, um, a personal view of cancer research in the last 30 years and some thoughts on the future of cancer treatment. Ah, great, there it is. And um, the first bit, Wear Sunscreen, is from, it's actually written by somebody in the Chicago Tribune in uh, 1997. Off we go, it's like, right, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it occasionally does that. Okay. Um, well, I'm used to having, uh, especially in the autumn, students coughing and sneezing a lot, so I guess I can survive that. Um, so, where sunscreen came from a, a really nice article that was written in the Chicago Tribune in, uh, by Mary Sheach um, in 97, and was then used by Baz Luhrmann. These are all names I'm sure you've never heard of, because 1997 is you know, before your time. Um, and he then had a number one hit with Wear Sunscreen. And the point about Wear Sunscreen was that he was, and I think I'm going to have to not use my slide because I think it's not going to work. I'll just jump to it and see if it's going to play. This computer really doesn't like my slides. It's just frozen again. Come on, hello. Now it's going back to the beginning. Yes. Okay. So, so Baz Luhrmann, as I was just saying, who we would not have heard of, I'm sure had a number one hit with Wear Sunscreen, and it was presented as, um, it, in exactly the form it was originally written, which was a, a graduation day speech. So, ladies and gentlemen of the class of 97, it was 1997, um, wear sunscreen. The benefits of sunscreen have been proven by science, whereas the rest of my monologue has no more basis than my own meandering experience, paraphrasing what he would have said, on this video had it played. And the point was that he goes on with this advice to young people, and, and one of the points that Mary Sheik was making in this thing is that older people, like me, love giving advice to younger people, although it's probably not really worthwhile, because the younger people won't believe it or accept it until they become older anyway, if it's right, and some of it will be wrong. So anyway, so the purpose of this lecture, from my point of view, was just to highlight um, a couple of things that have really transformed medicine um, and which justify, um, I think, um, the enthusiasm that was had in the early 70s and 80s for what was then termed molecular biology. And in case you haven't realized it, it has actually transformed your business of, of medicine and medical research. So that was the point of this slide that didn't work. And um, this all started for me in this place. Actually, it started in the building that's over here, which I cannot find a picture of on the internet. The only thing I can find on the internet is the new building, which has completely swallowed the old building that used to be there, um, at the Institute of Cancer Research in London on 237 Fulham Road. And the new building, which is about that big, um, completely swallowed the old building. And then this was the original Chester Beatty Labs. And that's my former supervisor there, Robin Weiss, talking to actually a guy I'm going to talk about today called Frank McCormick, who was actually based in San Francisco, but was also a British scientist uh, working on these things. So, yeah, I, I, I suspect that one of the things that's going to happen is that I'm going to be pacing around because I'm simply incapable of sitting still unless you actually force me to. Um, and so sometimes I'll be wandering in front of the webcam and sometimes I won't. But um, that's just life. Long, long projector. Right. So, cancer. Most of you, certainly in Liverpool, will have seen this before. Um, is the single biggest blob on this diagram of death. This is the almost half a million people who died in one particular year. This was in 2011. And the single biggest blob on there, bigger than circulatory diseases, etc., respiratory diseases, is cancer and neoplasms. And it's a major, I mean, we all know that it's a major problem. I think CRUK's latest publicity, they're actually saying that one in two people will be affected by cancer in their lifetime. So, it's always been pretty high side of one in three. Um, 
and roughly one in four people will die of this disease. So it's a, it's a major um, healthcare challenge. It's largely, ultimately, unavoidable. Uh, it's basically natural selection going wrong in our own bodies. But I'm going to talk about a couple of specific areas because I think they're, they're so much fun. And in fact, when I was at the Chester Beatty, this was the abstract I gave for Kumaraj. Uh, sorry for Kumararaj. Sorry, I can't pronounce your name very well. I apologize. Um, which was really just trying to see what kind of things he wanted me to talk about. And this was about um, arriving at Fulham Road Institute of Cancer Research in 98. And at that time, people like Greg Winter, who I'm going to talk about, and, um, and also um, Frank McCormick, were actually doing seminal work that has ultimately gone on to really have an impact on medicine. One of them, Greg Winter, developed uh, the technology to make humanized clin clinically functional monoclonal antibodies when he was at the LMB in Cambridge. And Frank McCormick developed a virus that turned out to be a bit of a dud, um, or they, so they thought, called Onyx 15, but which has now been approved a uh, Chinese derivative of it, which is essentially the same thing, but made by a different lab, um, which is now, uh, a couple of decades later almost, been approved by the Chinese for clinical use um, for head and neck cancer, amongst others. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of those things. And this is the slide that it really hates, which I will try to skip past accident. So this is what the game is all about, really, for us, thinking intrinsically about cancer. It's about the cell cycle. And tumor cells invariably find ways to subvert this and to take over the normal checkpoints that are in this cell cycle and cause cells to proliferate inappropriately. They also cause cells to not die when they should, and so on, and to change their microenvironment, et cetera, et cetera. But being simplistic, it's essentially this process that has to go wrong first. And if we focus on that a little bit, we can see there are four sort of main checkpoints in the cell. Uh, and the most interesting one from the point of view of the talk today is really this one down here, the G1S checkpoint, uh, which checks for DNA damage and determines whether or not the shell cell should enter S phase, because any damage that's replicated through into S phase uh, can no longer be detected or repaired. And just to give you a bit of uh, a reminder, I'm assuming you all know all of this already, um, this process is fundamentally regulated by cyclins. And these are biochemically inactive proteins in the sense that they don't have any enzymatic activities themselves, but they appear and disappear in a very predictable, very uh, time-controlled manner, such that you can tell where you are in the cell cycle by looking at the level of cyclin. So you can tell you're in late G1 if you see quite a lot of cyclin E and a lot of cyclin D, with a tiny bit of cyclin A starting to be synthesized. You know you're in late G1 there. If you don't see anything, you know you're out of the cell cycle. And if you see only cyclin D, you know you're in early G1, and so on. So this really is the molecular clock that programs things. And it operates by interacting with cyclin-dependent kinases. So that's what that says up there. It's been cropped. But cyclins bind to and activate cyclin-dependent kinases. And so these kinases, which are present in the cell all of the time through the cell cycle, are only active when their particular cyclin is present. So the cyclin binds to the cyclin-dependent kinase, and that then is able to modify the substrate proteins. And this type of post-translational modification is incredibly important in cells. The target of this for the G1S checkpoint is this guy, retinoblastoma, RB. And what happens is when the cell receives a growth signal, a pathway is activated that activates the cyclin expression. That then modifies RB, and what the kinase does, and RB gradually gets switched off by phosphorylation. Now this is all classic arcane um, molecular biology. You know, who cares? Why does anyone care about any of this? What, what, what does it matter? But it turns out that it's incredibly important. It's not the only part of this checkpoint. And so the other part of the checkpoint was discovered by studying viruses. And they've been incredibly useful tools. And I'm just going to...
transport train. antioxidant 30 years and see whether there's a difference and what's actually going to happen is that those people are all going to be doing so many different things and 2,000 of them will smoke um, you know so it's really it's really not easy to, to do that I, I, I'd love it I, please send me a link to that story because I haven't come across that particular one but I mean it, one of the things that happens is what you find is that if you if you pump a rat full of cabbage or, or broccoli um, it, it can actually increase their risk of cancer it depends how much you give them. Um, and so actually, I, I've always liked this idea of the Goldilocks phenomenon, you no know, Goldilocks and the three bears. So in cancer, what we find is that um, there are molecules like tumor suppressor genes, where if you have um, just the right amount, well, that's good. If you have too much, it's bad. And if you have too little, it's bad. So we as organisms have evolved in a fairly narrow window. It's rather like, you know, we're very comfortable somewhere between zero and 40 degrees. You know, the universe is capable of much greater extremes than that, but we can't survive those. So, you know, as biological entities, we live in a very narrow window of efficiency, around 37 way in our our bodies. And I think we can tweak things a little bit, but we probably find that there are problems. So, for example, we know if you have too much P53, the cell will either die or you'll senesce. So clearly, we've got to be very careful if we do that sort of thing, because that sort of addresses. I talked around your question, but the point, but uh, yeah. You had your hand up. I, I, was, I was going to, uh, you mentioned it okay. about the beta cancer uh, yeah. studies. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the, tr the trouble, it, and, and it's rather like, um, I mean, we, we published a paper a while back, because so we were very interested in, in MDM2, which regulates P53, and we discovered that MDM2 is actually regulating um, dihydrofellow reductase. And it does so via non ubiquitination, so it basically sticks a bit onto DHFR. And of course, DHFR is the enzyme that you need to metabolize folate. And we know there's an association between folate levels and cancer risk. But actually, what you find, in, and, and probably part of that connection is to do with the fact that folate is ultimately the source of methyl groups, and the methyl groups are what you use to switch on and off some genes. So there is a definite connection between gene expression and folate. The, the problem is that what you find is that different studies have found that high folate um, has one effect um, on one gene, so it might increase the switching off of that gene, which sort of is logical, but you might find that other genes get switched on and that's not logical, so we don't really understand that. And I think this is the point I was making to Christian earlier, one of the problems that we have is rather like when you engineer that virus, um, you know, you've gone up, up a scale from engineering a monoclonal antibody. That's a single protein entity. When you engineer a virus, virus, you're not engineering a biological entity. And guess what? You don't always think of all the things that might happen. And so then that's why people were very, very cautious about putting these things into people. Because, you know, if you get it really wrong, it could be a complete disaster. As a poor young man in the University of Pennsylvania found, he died. You know, from something that was largely a sort of virus that would normally give you a cold shouldn't have been a real problem, and he just died. So, you know, when we engineer things that get a bit more complex, and viruses, I mean, the viruses I'm talking about, adenoviruses viruses have eight genes, you've got 20,000. Guess what? We don't really understand how it all works. I don't know if that sort of gets to the point, actually, but it sort of is. With, um, uh, that sort of genetic engineering, which uses restriction engines, so Gene drive with genetically engineering, uh, say, traits of mosquitoes, so, so they're forced to carry something. Yes. Um, and, and that's a mosquito, obviously, just to stop the load transfer. Is there potential for that sort of thing in, in humans? I don't know if they're going to be carried out. Well, I mean, I think, so, so you start coming up against ethical issues. So, you know, I think if you look at whole genome sequencing, I think that within my lifetime, which I hope has still got a little bit to run, um, we'll see enough information about all of the risk factors for, for common diseases 
that someone can take my gene and go and sequence it and tell me why I'm really at high risk of, you know, I'm at risk of heart disease or I'm at risk of rheumatoid arthritis or I'm at risk of whatever. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting to the point, I don't know if you've seen a film called Gattaca with Jude Law, but basically the idea is that they um, are able to identify those people who are sort of pure and fit and don't have any of the high risk mutations, and all the others are sort of rejects. And that's, that's one of the ethical and, and uh, scary sort of uh, issues around this, is that of course the idea is that if you can do that, then the insurance companies would want to know that, because they want to know who is actually at high risk of making it into their 90s and who isn't. Um, of course, it doesn't take into account the possibility that you suddenly swerve across two lanes on the motorway and get killed in a terrible accident, of course, or that you didn't cause, that someone else caused for you. So you can't predict those sorts of events. Um, but when you look at that um, slide from The Guardian of who died of what, actually accidental deaths and so on are a really tiny part of that picture. It's mostly chronic illnesses that kill us. And those are potentially predictable up to a point. Um, so then the question is, could we, let's say you identify someone and we already do this with some genes, like uh, trisomy 21. We identify a fetus that has one of, a whole combination of really high-risk mutants, and they're going to have brown eyes, which you don't want, and they're going to look a bit ugly, which you don't want, and they're not going to be super intelligent. You know, that's a really scary, slippery slope to start thinking about. So, so we can't go that route. So then the other route is to say, OK, we know that this mutation and this mutation is really bad. These parents have it. Let's engineer the fetus so that it's got the perfect version of that gene. That's potentially doable. We can take embryonic stem cells, we can manipulate them, we do it in mice now. It's been done in higher species. You can do that, engineer them, and fix that baby's genes potentially for life. But I think that the first person who does that will not be in a, I think, in States or in Europe because the regulations will prevent it. It will happen somewhere where the regulations are not so strict, and I imagine there will be an enormous outcry and all sorts of people will go completely crazy about it because you're playing God. And, you know, there are all sorts of issues around it. So the potential to engineer us to be better, either at birth or later by infecting us with a virus that maybe integrates some gene that really helps us to live longer or something because it's got super antioxidant enzyme or something like that exists. I think, however, it won't happen certainly whilst I'm still on this planet because I think people will just be too scared of all the issues. And that, that's what was so nice about the Asilomar conference. They suddenly realised because Paul Berg was going to put this perfectly normal bacterium from somebody's gut and start putting new genes into it. And they suddenly thought, hang on, well he didn't think it, but he actually was, what happened was one of his postdocs spoke to another professor um, and uh, the professor happened to be working on pathogens and say, you're going to do what? You know, really, I think you need to think about this one. And so I think there are all these, these issues. I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I've addressed your, your point exactly. I think the question is such, but with the genetic engineering, I find it very interesting that tangent, because it, it I'm very much more genetic. Well, I mean, I think, I think where you have a really clear cut case that someone has, like, cystic fibrosis, someone has a really dreadful disease that is going to kill them when they're young, then I think trying to fix that, if you can do that, then I don't think too many people are going to have too many problems with that. The, the problems grow um, ethically and morally as you get away from this person is going to die in the first 10 years of their life from a horrible, they're going to have a horrible death and it's a horrible disease. There you can have, you, know, you sort of think, well, surely we, we should try to do something, no matter what it is. When you start talking about, well, yeah, you know, you've got a higher risk of this, um, it, it becomes a little bit more fuzzy about whether it's, it's appropriate. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, one of the challenges of this molecular biology, I mean, in order for molecular biology to directly benefit the patient, one of the challenges that is the cost to the healthcare. Yeah. Especially when you mentioned about all the monoclonal antibodies and how much it costs. And so, do you have any suggestions of how to? Because in order to directly benefit the patient, it needs to translate to clinical practice. Yeah, it needs to be used. And it's only feasible with yeah. you know, good, I mean, much cheaper cost. So, I mean, I, I can I can imagine a solution. Um, so, I can imagine um, because you know it's possible to get the exact sequence of the monoclonal antibody. 
So it's possible for someone in some part of the world, and I won't name any other suggestions at the risk of offending anyone, uh, there are a couple of countries I can immediately think of where I can imagine them just deciding, we don't care about patent law. We're just going to do it. What are you going to do? And we're going to make this cheaper, and then we're going to make it available, and yeah, have a nice life. So I can see that happening. It's, I mean, with on Onyx 15 is an interesting case in point. So that was actually a company funded by the Chinese government. And what they did was they developed a copy of Onyx 15 with some slight differences. And the differences may or may not be important. Um, and then, I think after they realized it looked like it was working, they bought the rights to Onyx 15 for millions, which was a project that had actually been shelved by that company because of the issues. So they, they then decided to go the sort of clean route, which is to say, okay, now we've got the rights for that, because we actually think this might be going somewhere and we don't want any trouble later down the line, because it could get very, very expensive. So, so you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe other countries will are afraid of the, the consequences of, of um, breaching the patents. But the, ultimately, all of these drugs will come off patent at some point. It might take a while, but eventually then, you know, the, either the company that makes it as, as we have now with generic ibuprofen or generic whatever, you know, there will be generic, you know, trastuzumab or generic Herceptin, and they'll be much, much cheaper because the company producing them didn't have to invest very much to produce the, the protein. You know, and we can grow, we can grow them in bacteria in the lab and, and, you know, across the road. We can do it on a fairly large scale. Probably keep us busy for... 30, 365 days a year, just producing enough for one or two people because you really need a bioreactor. But you know, it's doable. So, um, I think implementations of nanotechnology and uh, computer science in terms of like constructing nanomachines in order to, say, inject a gene that you're interested in. So, it's kind of like viruses, but. Yeah, I don't really. I don't know an awful lot about it. There are people in Liverpool who are doing stuff like that. Yeah. I suggest you get them to give you a talk. Um, and they'll tell you where it's really at. I mean, what I'm aware of is using different materials to try to target typically payloads, toxic payloads, for example, to tumor cells. And so the idea is that you have some kind of particulate material in an emulsion or something like that that will have a tendency to go to the tumor cells for some reason. That's really hard to do, actually. Um, one, of the, one of the real problems with um, tumor cancer therapy has always been that the tumor is basically you just gone a bit wrong. So it looks an awful lot like you. So it's very difficult to discriminate between it and you. And that's always been the problem. Killing tumor cells is a dog, as long as you don't like killing the patient. If you want to keep the patient healthy, then you have to be much more gentle with the tumor as well, generally. That's the problem. So I, I can't comment on you know, machines stuck to I mean, sort of science fiction-y type stuff, except that I know people are working on that, and, and um, you know, really tiny machines are being made that are sort of individual molecules um, strung together to do things. So um, I think we just have to... There's one professor in London that I met when uh, small like, conference really came to speak. Professor Stefano, I think his name is, he's, he's okay. done a lot of like, nanotechnology scaffolding. Yeah, so there are people doing that in, in the here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Chris Halloran, for example, is working with um, some, I think it's with some of the chemists, um, looking at pancreas cancer and trying to deliver nanoparticles to, to tumor cells. I think, the, I think it's very much in its infancy, and I think it, you know, whether it will have an impact on your lives, I don't know, but I suspect it will take a while because I think it is. Early, it's early days, but that doesn't mean it isn't interesting and doesn't have enormous potential. So I think it's a watch this space kind of thing. I suppose like it's a case of identifying the market as a consumer and then uh, programming these machines to you know, latch onto it, or if it control using Wi-Fi or some kind of. Well, it, one of one of one of the reasons I, I like in principle um, radiotherapy is that it gives you spatial control. So you always have the potential to have something that's excited by radiation that you can then point at. So in other words, you, have, you inject a patient with something, it goes everywhere. But you only irradiate where the tumor is, for example. And 
and obviously the radiation is designed to kill the tumor, but perhaps you can enhance that by having something that's already concentrated in those cells. It's in the other cells too, but because you're only targeting the tumor, it enhances the kill. I guess the advantage of that would be if you could use less radiation, then you'd get less toxicity and so on. And that could be a great benefit. And we've certainly, people tried to, to do that sort of thing. And we've even wondered whether you, know, you could use things that activate PMT3 like nothing in combination with radiation therapy to get lower doses of drug and lower doses of radiation to get the same effect. So that sort of thing, you know, people are thinking about cancer. But, yeah, the biggest problem in, 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 I mean, my talk wasn't focused entirely on cancer, but the biggest problem in cancer therapy is is the therapeutic index and the toxicities associated with the treatment. So even with these beautiful monoclonal antibodies, they're so clean, they're so non-toxic. Uh, no. It's not quite true. You know, they recognize cell surface molecules that happen to be on the tumor. But those molecules are expressed on other cells too. So there are toxicities associated with them, which is why if you've got five different companies making five different antibodies, and they've all engineered them in slightly different ways, they all recognize the same protein, but they might have different IgG components or been engineered in slightly different ways. The toxicities associated with those may be very different. So even though all five recognize the receptor, or the HER2, sorry, the HER2 receptor, they might induce different toxicities because they might act slightly differently. So that's part of the reason why there's so many of these things, because everyone's developing their own versions to see which ones work best. I think I think there is to some extent. You know, PET C T is based on the fact that the Warburg effect, as you rightly say, which was actually one of the things I thought about talking about, but I thought I would uh, just decide to do these bits instead. But the Warburg effect, in case anyone doesn't know it, is, is really the consequence of tumor cells adapt their metabolism and so they become very, very good at um, uptaking glucose. So they, they increase their glucose transport through uptaking, uh, upregulating receptors. And then they use glycolysis a lot more than normal cells. I don't think anyone knows for sure why they do that, but most of them do. And it's the basis of PET-CT, because you use um, 18F um, deoxyglucose, um, which then gets taken up just like glucose does by the glucose transporters and concentrated in the tumor, which is why the tumor lights up when you use PET-CT. Um, it doesn't work with all tumors. And of course, you know, when you do PET-CT, um, you'll see normal organs lighting up um, you know, like a Christmas tree. Um, and so you've got to be aware that this switch to glycolysis is all very well in the tumor and it might be abnormal for that cell type, but it's pretty normal in your brain. And um, you know, you're going to find a few other organs where there's quite a lot of glycolysis going on, that has got a fair bit going on. Um, you know, your muscle will be doing it. And so it's not so easy to exploit that as a monotherapy. But that's why I think there's huge potential. Um, we're, we're very interested, for example, in the idea that in head and neck cancers, which are primarily treated with radiation therapy, that the, um, if you inhibit glycolysis, the P53 mutant ones, which are the ones that are more likely to kill the patient generally, are more radiosensitive. So we're quite interested in the idea of using a glycolytic inhibitor for short time periods before you irradiate someone and that that would give an increased kill and might lead to you ultimately reducing the dose <coughs> for the same effect of therapy. So that sort of thing which it is, and that's potentially doable in many different tumors, especially ones where you have radiation therapy involved. <coughs> and there's no, if you, coming back to your actual specific question, so there's, I don't think there's anything that happens in a tumor cell that happens across the board to tumor cells that distinguishes them from normal cells. So for example, they do do certain abnormal things. They upregulate telomerase, they become immortal. But you have cells that express telomerase. They're called stem cells. So you don't necessarily want to kill all the cells that do that. That'd probably be bad, you'd die. Um, you know, they upregulate some fetal antigens. <coughs> that can be unique. Um, those usually aren't expressed in you as an adult. But most of the things they do are tweaking or altering 
what you're already doing. So it's a little more tricky. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I th I'm losing my voice, and I think now will be a good time to start. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how are you? I'm fine. We're going to have a five minute break, and then we'll move to the next speaker. Oh, yes. Did you um, stop the test? Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. You can keep those and um, have fun with them yourself. It's very kind of you. I don't really need them, honestly. I'm watching my weight. Um, no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very kind. And I actually agree to do this just because I thought, you know, I always like to support anything that medical students or students are doing because, um, you know, I think it's great that you guys are actually taking the trouble to be interested. So I'm very happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do hope you, um, you will be interested in our conference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just need to. Just depends when it is. Um, yeah. It'll be on March the 11th. I've got a funny feeling I might be in Egypt. Mm. I know I'm in Egypt in the middle of March. We're just in that one place.